Good evening. You're watching the Digital Age, and I am James Goodale. Is the coming election going to be a election in which there will be fundamental change? The country, will the country be going off in an entirely different direction? Our guests we have tonight think so, and they are Morley Winograd. Nice to see you, Jim. And Michael Hayes. Pleasure to be here, Jim. And they are here because they've written a terrific book. Thank you. It's called The Millennium, Millennial Makeover, My Space, You Too, and the Future of American Politics. So what we want to ask them tonight is whether these millennials, and we'll define the millennials for you in a minute, are going to tip the election in the favor of Obama. Now, Morley, why don't we start sort of at the end? And I want to ask you about the size of the millennials and their impact on the election. But before doing that, I want to say briefly that your theory is that if you look at uh, generational change, let's say 30 or 40 years, every 30 or 40 years we have a, we have a big change. And your book, I'll let you talk about this at greater length, but your book says we're at that point and we have a new generation that's going to drive that change and for ease of conversation, uh, I like to think of it as the 18 to 29 year old group. Oh, in fact, you say it's really people who were born in 1981, so I uh, enlarge it slightly. Slightly. Yeah. But uh, the reason I did is because when you look at the election surveys, yes. you can right. find them for 18 to 29, but yes. you can't find them for your little slice of life. Okay. So, uh, how many of those millennials live out there? Well, as I've defined them. There, well, as you've defined them, there's probably closer to 100 million millennials, uh, which means there's about 10 million more millennials than there are boomers, the folks born between. 45 and 64, and twice as many millennials as Gen Xers, almost twice as many who were born between six, between uh, the uh, end of the boomer uh, age in uh, 1965 and 1982 or one when the millennials were born. Uh, the important part there is that this is a very large, it's the largest generation in American history, very large generation so they can have an electoral impact and because they're a generational type we call civic, they're ready to have an impact. They're voting in record numbers. All right, now let's, how many are gonna vote this time of that group, do you think? Uh, obviously we don't know 100% no, at but this point. This is just uh, but, but, it, but at this point, it certainly looks like more than young people in previous generations have voted recently. Uh, in 19, uh, in, I'm sorry, in 2004, uh, in that election, the 18 to 29 year old population, most of which was made up of gener Generation X, 47% of them voted. But in the primary elections of this year, the contribution of millennials, this younger civic generation that Morley spoke about, was two, three times higher than it had been in, say, the year 2000. Right. So the, one of the things when we talk about, when we're trying to figure out the answer, how many we got here, how many are going to vote, how many uh, uh, votes will Obama pick up? But one of the things that's, of course, hard to figure is how many will vote because uh, the sort of political wisdom on this is, well, they talk a lot, but they don't vote very much. But that's only true of young people who are of a different generation. Gen X, a very alienated, skeptical generation raised as latchkey kids without a lot of nurturing. Yes, they're very cynical and they're, they're the anti-government types um, and they're, and th you know, they're they have not voted in record numbers, and when they've done so, they've tended to favor Republicans. That's not who the millennials are. They're a civic-minded generation raised with parents who are absolutely focused on building up their self-esteem, nice job every time they did something, trophy for anything they ever did. And they're confident and interested in civic participation. Uh, as Mike said, you know, you had a 47% turnout rate amongst people of that age in prior elections, but we would expect it to go as potentially as high as 60% in this coming election. As high as 60%. At, at, and a minimum, that, that at was, a minimum, it would at least be 55%, yeah. somewhere in that range. And it was 47% before. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so if you take this, uh, these numbers and you high, apply a higher percentage, you're obviously going to come out with more votes. And uh, I think it's fair to say 
that because, as you pointed out in your book, and you're not getting a chance to point it out to me or the audience, the uh, trend of this group is heavily democratic. And that's, and that's, the, and that's a very good point, Tim, yeah. because the second part of this is not only the large numbers of this generation, but it's the unity of this generation. This is a generation that identifies as Democrats by about a two to one margin. And it's the first generation in three or four really since the GI generation of which the millennials are the, uh, the uh, lineal descendant, they're the, the greatest generation, that, that type of generation, the civic generation. It's the first one in three or four in which there are more people willing to call themselves liberal rather than conservative. And that, the term liberal has sort of been debased in American right. politics, and this is a generation willing to accept that term. So now if you're doing the math, math on this, you got a 60% uh, square in the turnout before, which was 47%. The, uh, we didn't say what the split was last time between uh, Kerry but and... Ba barely, in fa what was in favor of Kerry, it's the only generation outside of the GI generation that voted for Kerry over Bush. Right. And by it was, a small margin. But it was uh, a small margin. It's like 1.7 million votes, something like that. You, you, your numbers are, are yeah. right okay. on target. So okay. it was 55, roughly 55-45 right. for Kerry, and it's about a 1.8 million plurality for Kerry over right. Bush okay. in that generation. All right. So. What the fun of this is, uh, in terms of digging into your book, is you take that math and it looks as though, according to you, and I think most people would agree, that the, the percentages are ratcheting in favor of the Democratic candidate. Exactly. And so the answer to the question is, if Kerry had one, oh, here. Okay. okay. <laughs> He's the numbers guy. Oh, yeah, and you're a numbers guy. I'm the numbers guy. Uh, okay. Uh, if Kerry uh, had a 1.7 million plurality, what do you think Obama's plurality would be? Well, I even if only 47% of this group votes, which I don't think is going to be true, it's going to be higher than that, it would still be about 8 million because of the unity of this group. 8 million, eight million plurality? Pl plurality for this particular group of people. Now you 8 million. Now hear that. Now, listen, I've been move it to 60%. Move it, to up to, move it up to 55%, it yeah. goes up to 9 million. Move it up to 60%, it goes up over 10 million. So it's somewhere between 8 and 10 million vote plurality from the millennials. I mean, this is amazing. Now, I have to tell you, that I have spent three days trying to figure out the answer to that question. I said, you said you spent, before we went on, you said you spent 45 minutes. Yeah, but I spent 45 years of my life doing this. <laughs> and you can add. Apparently. Well, I don't know. And multiply and divide. I can use a calculator Add, multiply, nicely. and divide. I can't, I can't seem to it's do it. It's a digital it. age. You can do it on but a computer. But you know, uh, I had a, an assistant with me, and I gave him this, this project, and he's very bright. And he kept bringing back eight, nine, or 10 million. I said, that can't be right. I don't know any. I haven't read that any, anywhere before. And by the way, have you? Uh, I, well, have I, you I knew it would be bigger, but but uh, have you, you read didn't? anywhere? No, in because you gave us the opportunity. That's to, why to you watch the, the digital age. You learn, yeah, learn new, learn new, new, new things. Things. Absolutely. Well, of course, most political pundits have missed this generation altogether. Yeah. In fact, if you go back inside the Democratic Party, Mark Penn's. Uh, the Obama speech, the Iowa Jeff Jack dinner. Those people all look like belo they belong on Facebook. Well, exactly. And but he, they don't vote because he thought they were Gen Xers. So, so not only of pundits, but expert politicians, smart strategists, haven't understood this generational change. So, and the, the three things to remember about this generation that makes them absolutely crucial is, in this particular context, they're big, they're a large generation, they are active, and they're united. And that's a great combination, which I think will be may make the difference for Obama this. Well, in may November. make the difference. Well, it should make. What the difference. are we talking about? Well, may make the difference. No, wait a minute. May make the difference. If you figure that um, they picked up 1.7 million, Kerry picked up 1.7 million right, before. Right. Right. And then we fool around with these numbers. You know, we can ratchet them down, but no matter how you look at it, it looks like a big number. Maybe as large as eight or nine million now. Remember, Kerry uh, Bush, rather, only won by three million. Right. And here you're telling me there's the margin of victory all over again. Well, if everything, if everything, everything stays, stays the same, same. Stays the if same. everything stays the same, and then he's going to win by eight million votes? Well, well no, no. Uh, uh, two one, million minus eight, 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 six, eight, eight, six, eight, six and million. Then, then subtract by, by, million. But the important thing, all, another important thing to remember is that you, look at, you have to look at the other generations who are going to be voting in this election, yeah. people older than millennials. And why the millennials are crucial is because they are united. 
the uh, Gen Xers are, and the baby boomers are roughly evenly divided in their support of Obama and McCain. The uh, silent generation, the oldest generation, is marginally for McCain, but not as much as the millennials are. So for Obama. over 65 would be for McCain. For McCain. And everybody's looking at senior citizen vote, but yeah. actually the millennials are going to be just as big. Well, will the senior citizen vote uh, uh, wipe out this? No, it's no. The, because the marginal difference, as Mike said, will it be in their preferences for candidates is not as large. Will the senior senior vote this time around be uh, more in favor of uh, uh, of the Republicans yeah. than was before? Than was before. It's it's doubtful. Well, I rest my case. <laughs> well, we better find out who these guys who these guys are. So uh, who the millennials are? Yeah, who are these? Uh, besides being the largest generation in American history, they're the most diverse. Forty percent of them are non-white, either Asian American, Latino, or African American, or a mixed race. Twenty percent of them have an immigrant family. Uh, so they are, and, and of course the size of the generation continues to grow even though the birth dates are over uh, because of immigration. They have been raised in a multiracial, multi-ethnic uh, society with friends of all different races. They are very tolerant on social issues. And just as similar generations have in the past, they are not interested in the social issue debate. They're focused on economics. They don't like economic inequality. They think the government ought to take a more active role in the economy. And on foreign affairs, they're multilateralist in, uh, interventionists. Are you just saying in a long, I didn't use winded, way that they're liberals? Well, they certainly call themselves liberals. More of them, almost twice as many, call themselves liberals as conservatives. But I, they, they do. But I think it's, it's whatever the term liberalism means. It, we're, in a way, we're returning to a previous version of liberalism, of of government intervention and activism in foreign policy with a multilateral situation, as opposed to the version of liberalism that focused on social issues such as uh, gay rights and abortion, things of that nature. All right, that's so, not where they're at. They're okay, on the economics. So, uh, that's who they are. Um, that's what their numbers are. Uh, Michael, do you want to put this in, in the context of history? Sure. Uh, because what does history tell us is going to happen? I say going to happen, and you could say may happen, whatever you <laughs> want. But I, well, no, I, will say go, I will say going to happen. Oh, you're going to happen. I, I will be much more bold oh, about this right. now. Okay. Uh, it, it, essentially, what history has told us is that every 40 years in America, there is a political realignment or a political makeover. The political process has changed. The party that has been the dominant party ends up becoming the minority party. The other party emerges. We see a, dif a difference in public policy, things of this sort. And these realignments occur for two reasons, as we point out in our book. One is the, the emergence of a new large dynamic generation like the millennial generation or the baby boomers before them in the, in the late 1960s and the emergence of the new technology that allows this generation to be mobilized. And that is what is happening right now before our very eyes in this country. Well, let's leave, put, I want to talk about the technology. Obviously, it's the digital age. Right? Yes, exactly. Right. Uh, but I just want to get clear on uh, your lessons from history. When so you, let me, let yeah, me give you ahead. one example. Yeah, go ahead, Marley. Because we're in the middle of economic crisis, uh, reminiscent of the 1930s, come to think of it, and that was the last civic realignment with the GI generation. Uh, one statistic that might be helpful. In 1929, obviously before the stock market crash, uh, the wealthiest 1% of Americans owned 50% of the nation's wealth. Say that again. Well, the 1% of the richest Americans owned 50% of the nation's wealth in 1929. And that was sort of the end of an era, idealist era, much like the end of the idealist era we're coming out of, the one that started in 1968 with Richard Nixon's election. By 1949, only 30 percent of the nation's okay. wealth was owned by the wealthiest 1 percent. Now, some of that was the effect of the Great Depression. Some of it was redistributionist tax policies and other events. By, by 2001, in this idealist era we're coming out of, the sort of laissez-faire, laissez uh, de deregulation kind of approach uh, led to 40, uh, about 45 percent of the nation's wealth being owned by one percent of the richest that Americans. What year is that? That's about, t more recently, about 2004. 2001 yeah. it was 40 percent. Well, what's going to happen in the civic era that we're entering is once again that I economic inequality is going to go down. Not just because a whole bunch of rich people lost a lot of money this week, but also because when civic era government takes effect, 
both Democrats and Republicans, as you can hear from the two candidates, argue for heavier government role in the economy and redistributionist tax policies become more popular because somebody's got to pay for it and it shouldn't be me. And I, and I think it might be worth defining because Morley is the term idealist era. Yeah, I wish you would say that. Era. I, I mean, so let me tell, we can define those Let terms. me tell you my own, my own context and maybe that of, of the audience. Uh, perhaps this is unfair, but when we're in a conservative era, uh, I usually don't apply idealism to, them because, to it because for whatever reason, 1% and up owning 50%, that doesn't seem very idealistic. But it's but, very ideological. Yeah, but I, but I just wanted to make clear for our viewers and for our conversation that you're talking about uh, the last uh, X years, 40, 40 years, years or and so. it's a conservative area, and you're, and you're saying it ideal, idealistic, it's a conservatively idealistic. Well, it, it, yeah. it's really more ideological than idealistic, yeah. and, and, oh, okay. and, and we're borrowing terms from yeah. the founders of generational theory. Their, their idea is that, our idea is that there are two types of generations that create realignments. One is called an idealist generation, like the baby boomers. It's a generation okay. that's driven by its internal values, its morality. It tries to enact its morality on the political process. These generations, idealist generations, tend to be heavily divided. The baby boomers were a very divided generation. You saw that with the notion of gender gap, women voting one way, men voting the other way. And as a result, it is conservative in one sense that nothing happens in, in terms of the economy. Things pretty much remain the same. And one of the it, it, things that, and there's a focus on social issues, and rather than economics, rather than uh, major foreign policy change, and one of the things that occurs is the economic inequality that Morley spoke about. The second kind of realignment is produced by a, a, a civic generation that operates as a group, tries to find win-win solutions to problems, deals with, and it tends to be a united generation, and, 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 and deals with trying to revitalize political, public institutions, and therefore you see a more activist government, which is where we're headed right now. I want to ask you a question. Why don't we learn anything? I mean, here we are, <laughs> uh, sitting with a huge uh, financial crisis this week, probably uh, one of the worst weeks in American history, maybe only surpassed by whatever the week was in, in, in 1929. Uh, the wealth was held, as you point out, which is a very interesting uh, statistics. Uh, we have a policy that comes in that, let's face it, redistributes the wealth. And then the conservatives are back in power and they ratchet right up again. We have another great big, right. Right, another great big bang. I'm like, it's just, it's, this is easy for you, you guys, isn't it? It's, it's, this theory, because it's just unraveling in front of your eyes. It is, in, it is, in fact, true that that cycle occurs. The reason we don't learn from it is that one of the things that Americans are very good at is making sure they raise their kids differently than the way they were raised. Yeah. And they bring... That's, that's the key to all They this, bring it? different sets of values yeah. to the political yeah. process. And so that's what's happening. So as uh, these kids were raised, they were raised by a uh, more conservative a group of parents. Late boomers, yeah. some Gen or Xers. more conservative than... Well, 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 so some, they're going yeah, to so go a different but direction. But conservative probably, or right? liberal parents, yeah. all the same. They yeah, all, all the raise same, their yeah. kids like they yeah, were watching right. the Huxtable. Yeah, so, these, so they're going to come, uh, come, uh, come out differently. Now, let me ask you something. I'll ask you both. One of the interesting parts of this book is that you say there's a transformative moment, uh, which is, I guess, now... <laughs> and uh, you, and in the and in the in the book you point to all these huge big bangs that happened historically. Right. And uh, you don't think 9/11 is necessarily one of them. And I went through the book. The uh, I don't know if I buy that as much as I buy the general. So here's the question: Did we have the big bang this week that you are looking for in your theory? And as now now you can rest your case. Case closed. Uh, I, I think there's a very good chance that it's moving the country in that direction. I, I, I can't totally, we can't totally predict the future as far as what any individual event is going to be. I think we can talk about trends. But I, in one respect, I think 9-11 was a part of the Big Bang because it focused this, this younger generation on issues of security, on, on, on internationalism, things of that nature. And yes, I think that the, the Big Bang of, of what's happened in Wall Street, I think things like Hurricane Katrina, you know, in, in, in part, 
were focused on that too because it told people we really do need government. We can't weaken our government so that we can't respond to crises. Well, so, let me so, let you, so let let's, you, but will you, well, will so you agree with me this is the big bang? Well, so let's be optimistic and say it's not. That's actually <laughs> a pessimistic view. That means something worse is going to happen. <laughs> so I would rather say yes between 9-11 on the international affairs, the obvious failure of Wall Street and the government to regulate it this this week and the economic crisis that unfolds are the kind of triggering events, as we call them, that take these forces that are coming together, the generational change, the technology and the communications, and suddenly everybody gets a new opinion of how the world works. And a lot of that happened this week. Okay, let's pick up on that uh, last point, because your book is not only Millennial Makeover, but it's MySpace, YouTube, and the future of American politics. Why are MySpace and YouTube relevant to uh, your book, your theory, to our conversation. Well, uh, let me back up just a little bit and say that, that when these political makeovers and realignments occur, one of the reasons they occur is, is because of the change in generation. Another is because of the change in technology. And these things have always been linked together in history. So the 1930s realignment was radio allowed a gener new generation to be mobilized in the 1960s was TV. And in this particular era, it's going to be the internet-based social networking communications which allows for this generation to be mobilized, but I, and Morley can talk about this in great detail, but it, it also allows, this is unique, because it allows the members of this generation to mobilize one another. All of the other uh, communications revolutions were still broadcast in the sense there was a central authority broadcasting out to, to the public, and this is going to be different. And that's, Mike's point is very important. That's, that's beyond missing the millennials, the other mistake that the Clinton campaign made in this election was believing that TV and top-down media-oriented campaigns with lots of big buck money behind it would be the key to victory because it has been for the last 40 years. However, the Dean campaign in 2004 showed that internet organizations could raise you a lot of money and get you some support. But what uh, the Barack Obama campaign has done with MyBarackObama.com, which is a Facebook platform, it's not a normal website. When people come there, they fill out a profile, they find friends who think like they do, the friends organize each other. It's not driven by the campaign, it's driven by the campaign's cause that pulls people there and lets them self-organize. And it beat, Obama in the primary beat the very best Democratic top-down campaign that we've ever seen. But isn't that, uh, uh, what is the phrase, the pe converted, talking to the converter, the preacher, the choir, mean, what, whatever that is. Preaching to the choir? Yeah. Uh, aren't well, they but, just reinforcing what they already think what, by look what social networking? But look what they're reinforcing. First of all, millennials, are that's how millennials make decisions. They, they go and they ask their friends what they think, and if everybody thinks the same thing, then that's the right thing to think, whether experts agree with them or not. But what that reinforcement in a political context does is it drives these enormous increases in turnout, it's, it enables you to mobilize people, and it raises gobs of money, $66 million the last month, 500,000 new donors. I mean, it just feeds on itself to the point where I, you know, it's, we're, we're getting to the point where 1%, 2% of the electorate is already on this website contributing to the campaign and organizing. That's a very powerful force. Yeah, I, I, I would agree that the organizing uh, factor is extraordinary. What I can't get clear in my mind is uh, whether that means that if you're running a campaign and you've got all this money that you're raising, uh, you say, no, I'm not going to put it into TV because that's not where the action is. is that we haven't quite reached that point. No, have we, I, we, we certainly haven't. Um, yeah. the, the old media never totally died. I mean, yeah. radio from the 1930s, but the Republicans, obviously, with people like Rush Limbaugh in the, in the, in, in the last... 10, 15 years, managed to use radio very effectively to mobilize their own forces, and TV is still going to be there. For one thing, there are still generations of people who are going to depend more on TV. Boomers than, in particular. Boomers in particular than, than other generations will. So it won't disappear, but it will be have to be integrated into a broader kind of campaign. It's not going to be the dri it's total driving force that it has no, been. And, and if you years. look at the proportions being spent on television versus other activities by the Obama campaign, it's quite revolutionary. Oh, what They're is pouring it? a ton of money into field organization, voter registration, oh, many more dollars motivating individual voters, talking to them very cheaply on the internet. That's a whole different set of the campaign. And television, as Mike said, is not the driving force. That's an, that's an interesting question. One of the uh, 
uh, fallouts of looking at the numbers is that McCain looks like he's actually uh, going to raise a lot of money, although not for the uh, campaign itself, so to speak, but for the for, right. for the party. Now, when you look at the money that uh, McCain allocates to your activities compared to what o Obama does, what do you think the difference in percentages would be? Well, he, uh, as near as we can tell, Obama's at least outspending him two to one, if not three to one. On, the, on the ground, on the, on the ground, on the ground. And it, and it's important because you're trying to mobilize in 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 many instances people who have a tradition, uh, the, the notion of young people not voting, they're going to make sure they vote. The mo vo mo notion of, of, of minorities, African Americans who have uh, large numbers haven't been able to, or been willing to vote in the past. Why hasn't all this showed up in the polls? Well, because the pollsters don't know as much as Mike does. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I think there are a number of issues here. One is that, that, uh, that, that, first of all, it's how you have to reach people. And most of the polling today is still done uh, with landline telephones, uh, some with, on, uh, with, oh. with cell phones, mostly landline telephones. A lot of the folks, and millennials in particular, don't have access to landline phones. Now, there may be ways of reaching them other, otherwise, but you're still not reaching quite as large of a sample, robust of a sample. But even more than that is they, they're using models, likely voter models, that may not be as helpful because it's from a different era. The people uh, who are likely Michael, to Michael, I'm sure you're correct, but the only problem I have with your statement is I heard that four years ago. Ah. <laughs> four, I heard that four years ago. Yeah, we got all these the, votes. And the millennial out. vote, the millennial vote didn't show up. Wait, 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 no. The Gen X vote didn't show up. Millennials oh. voted in very nice numbers. Oh, they did? Oh, yeah, there just weren't as many of them. There just weren't that many of them. There were only the four years later. The numbers are quite different. Very quickly, what effect is this going to have on our politics, uh, the way we make decisions, the way we think about governance? We well, are going to have a positive attitude towards government. People are going to want the government involved. I'm here from the government. I'm here to help isn't going to be a, a joke. Uh, the second thing you're going to see is a great deal of partisanship, increased party loyalty. Increased less, partisanship. Yeah, absolutely. Less split ticket voting. Uh, Senator McCain makes the point that he's been able to work with the other party in a bipartisan way and can't figure out why Obama continues to say he can when he doesn't have a bipartisan record. In civic areas, that's not the way it works. You have positive partisanship. All right, you so have partisanship on behalf of the country. Okay, guess what? We've reached the end of this wow. program. I mean, we could go on for another hour. So, Michael, is Obama going to win the election because of the support and the numbers that the millennials give him. That would be the way yes. I feel. Yes. 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 Thank you very much for coming by. Certainly. And <laughs> I'm going to ask a different question. What's I mean, question? You, seriously, you don't think there's any doubt that Obama will win? I don't see any way he could unless some just thing very could, dramatic yeah, happens. Okay. In hey, thanks a lot for coming by. Thank Both you, you guys much. from California. I don't have a chance to talk to California. We're delighted to be thank here. You. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for coming by and come by next week. And you can learn more about the digital age. For the Digital Age, I am James Goodale. Good night and have a good week.